Hello NR1 students, Walter Pullman here and uh, I'm just really pleased to be here in this fantastic location with one of our TAs, Michael, and uh, I'd say this spot here is one of the most iconic locations in Vermont. On a beautiful fall day, colors are just changing and we're at the base of Mount Mansfield at the Stowe Mountain Resort. We're getting ready for one of our labs. Some of you may come here uh, during the school year, either this fall to ride the gondola or maybe you're going to come here skiing. It's uh, really an incredible spot to uh, not only recreate but study the ecology of Vermont and really understand a lot more about the biological diversity of our state because this is where it happens in terms of elevation gradients. And uh, as we look up here, we're going to uh, take advantage of the fact that for the ski resort, there is a gondola going up. And we're at about 1,600 feet in elevation. And we're going to take a quick trip north, really, for about 2,000 feet, up to 3,600 feet, and get up to the Cliff House. And from there, we're going to begin our ascent all the way up to the ridgeline of Mount Mansfield and uh, the highest point in Vermont. From the other side there, we're going to be able to look over and see Lake Champlain and the UVM campus, I think. We're psyched you're with us for this virtual tour. I'm glad, Michael, you're along with us. That's Anything right. you want to add to what we just said about the objectives of the day? Yeah, so uh, one of the main goals today is going to be to look at how this landscape changes across an elevation gradient. We're going to pass through some different natural communities as we move uh, higher up in elevation. And eventually we're going to reach the Alpine Zone, which is a unique community in Vermont that you don't get to see in many locations. And then we're also going to look at just how skiing and the other forms of recreation around here have influenced the development of this area, the human side of, of things in Stowe. That's a great point, Michael. Really this idea of how does land use, in this case, a super important piece of the economics of Vermont, and that is the ski industry. But how, what, are the, what are the parts of it that impact, for instance, vegetation and wildlife habitat, and even possible the hydrology of the landscape? What does it take to make snow? What happens uh, when uh, snow melt is coming off this landscape? So that's all part of our plan today. In NR1, we study the whole social ecological system. Today, we're up in the mountains looking at that whole thing. So we're glad you're with us. All right, here we go. We're in the gondola. Again, thanks to Stowe for letting us have this trip up here because it's just an awesome day to be viewing uh, not only the larger landscape up to Smuggler's Notch, in particular we can view the elevation gradient and how the changing vegetation sort of adheres to the change in elevation as we go up. So as I'm looking out the window here, we're right in the spot where it is the northern hardwood forest. And as we start to go up, we are, I think here, at about 1,800 feet. So beach and sugar maple, and we'll keep our eye out for yellow birch as well, because those are the big three. And as we continue up this gradient, usually what happens is that the first of the ones that drop out is beech, and then sugar maple a little bit after that, and yellow birch really persists as we go up and starts to mix in with the red spruce forest. Other species I'm seeing in here as we're looking out the window are striped maple in the understory. There's actually quite a bit of it, and when we get up to this tension zone, which is at about 2,500 feet, that's the spot at which the northern hardwood forest really starts to shift over to the montane red spruce forest and mixing in with increasing amounts of balsam fir. As the daylight changes and the colder temperatures come in, of course, it triggers the changes in the pigmentation of the leaves and the red pigmentation and the yellow and the orange underneath the green, underneath the chlorophyll, starts to show through, especially in the top of the foliage. Oh, there's our first red spruce in the mix here. That means we must be getting up close to about 2,000 feet is really where they start to come in their own. As we were talking about down low, uh, every time you go up 500 feet, quite a few differences occur. Every thousand feet of elevation change usually means about three to five degrees in temperature. Overall, if you kind of average that across the year, a temperature drop of three to five degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And as you go up as well, usually you gain three to five inches of rainfall as well. 
and the overall growing season changes dramatically. Ooh, I'm looking out here and I'm seeing a, a, a kind of a good change and we're seeing our first balsam fir in the mix, one of the hardiest of our evergreens. It will be up there right in the Krumholtz when we get up uh, above 3,000 feet. There's a red maple. That's a good sign to see. Red maple is actually surprising. Red maple is a species that can occur down at lake level with its roots in Lake Champlain, and it occurs even higher than sugar maple, sometimes up to about uh, 3,000 feet. Of course, as we go up here to ultraviolet radiation is changing a bit. It's not nearly what happens when you go up into the Rockies, but still it's a significant factor for plants, especially up in the alpine zone, to be able to, to deal with that. Something that we're protected from right here, but we'll feel once we get out of the cliff house, is the, is the wind. Winds can be uh, tremendous here when you get up higher. As people know, when you get up uh, into the White Mountains, uh, into Mount Washington, the highest winds recorded on Earth were actually up uh, in the mountains of the, of the Northeast. So it can be quite windy, it can shape the trees, and all those are environmental stresses. Oh, I'm seeing our first uh, mountain ash is coming into the understory here as well. So mountain ash along with striped maple uh, become part of the, of the trees in here. You can see the, the uh, compound leaves. Oh, and now we're getting into some of the high elevation birch as well. Paper birch has a uh, subspecies, I believe, called heartleaf paper birch or montane birch. And we're getting into that as we go up higher as well. One thing that's really interesting, we've got a clear day today, but uh, if you're down in Burlington or in other areas and you're looking up on kind of a gray November day, you usually see that the cloud level hovers at a right about 2,500 feet. And that 2,500 feet level also corresponds to really the shift over from the northern hardwood forest uh, to the montane uh, spruce fir forest. And when you think about it, if clouds are hovering there, uh, essentially the uh, moisture in the clouds is going to precipitate out into moisture and it's going to make the soils above 2,500 feet just much wetter and, uh, and therefore leaving, leading to a lot more frost that occurs and just generally harsher conditions. So while in general, when you go up with precipit when you go up in elevation and you get this idea of orographic precipitation, as the clouds rise up, they can't hold as much moisture, so they drop them as rain or as snow. There's actually a point that we're coming up on here at 2,500 feet where the clouds tend to hang in the winter. And I think we're coming up on it right here. As we look up uh, the hillside from this break in the road, uh, I think you can see that it's really dominated uh, by spruce fir, along with different species of hardwood trees. I'm seeing mostly mountain ash in here, and we're getting into the high elevation birch as the other species. Really, beech is largely dropped out. Sugar maple is dropped out. The one species that is mixed in here of the big three northern hardwoods is yellow birch. In fact, there's a montane yellow birch red spruce forest that's right in this zone right here at about 2,700 feet. But eventually, the, uh, the yellow birch drops out as well, and it pretty much becomes dominated by red spruce and balsam fir with the high elevation birch really mixed into the canopy. Not far from the cliff house, we passed that tension zone, that transition zone, and we're at about 3,000 feet. One thing you can notice is actually the tree height is getting significantly shorter. Soils are getting thinner, environmental conditions are getting more challenging, and therefore for these trees to survive, they really can't be as tall. They're shaped by the wind, shaped by the frost, shaped by the snow and the wind together creating what we call uh, ultimately the Krumholtz forest or the crooked tree forest that really starts to dominate the forest as we get to tree line and eventually the trees are just not going to be able to survive any longer and we'll get up above tree line as we generally approach 4,000 feet. So basically as we come up we're almost to the cliff house we've taken a quick trip north as we've gone up 2,000 feet in elevation it's equivalent of going way up north into Quebec, at least environmentally, and uh, we'll see what awaits us when we get on the ground.
All right, well, we made it, Michael. After that strenuous gondola ride, we're all the way up at 3,800 feet. Actually, we started at 1,600 feet, rode 2,000 feet up in the gondola, and we're just a few, uh, few hundred yards up the trail. But we wanted to stop here because we're in this uh, beautiful example of a montane spruce fir forest. And Michael, what do you see here that helps us determine that that's the case? Yeah, so as the name suggests right here, we're looking at a red spruce. They have the spikier needles, which is a, a key giveaway for those. And then over here we have a balsam fir, which has more fuzzy needles, you know, fuzzy fir, as we say. And then up here is a form of montane birch or heart leaf birch. Uh, you can tell by the shapes of the leaves there. Um, that's a, a clear giveaway of the, the tree there. Excellent, excellent. And as we always like to do in NR1, let's take a look at the soils. Of course, I brought my trusty uh, pH kit here. And uh, let me grab a little bit of the soil down here. And if you read about this in uh, Wetland, Woodland, Wildland, it'll tell you that we have a spodosol, which is basically a type of soil in these high elevation areas. And uh, what I'm going to do is essentially take my well here Add a little bit of our reagent to it, two drops. And Michael, if I could ask you to hold this, that'll be a preview of what we're gonna see. Again, the color change indicates the concentration of hydrogen ions in the soil. And uh, let me get a little bit, add just enough in there to soak up that reagent. The reaction is occurring now. Take my spoon and I'll mix it in carefully. Make a flat sloping surface and add our reagent to it. Here it comes. The reaction is occurring and what do you think, Michael, when we look at that? It's quite down on the... Real acidic, it's for like sure. A, like about 4.0. So this yeah. is very, lots of hydrogen ions in here. Not a lot of other nutrients for the plants to work with, but these uh, spruce and fir seem to be well adapted to it. Let's head up to yeah. the ridge line. <laughs> We made it, Michael. This last scramble uh, up through the spruce fir forest, and now we're up on the long trail. The whole trail that runs all the way north to the Canadian border and down to Massachusetts. Uh, we took a quick trip up here. But it's a fantastic spot to be on this sunny fall day. We're a little above 4,000 feet, and if we actually look down this way, uh, everybody in NR1, I'm looking back towards the UVM campus. Uh, I could see Burlington in the distance, Shelburne Bay, Lake Champlain, and of course the Adirondacks in the distance. But boy, the wind is picking up. These aren't the easiest conditions for life. What can you tell us about the ecology of this place, Michael? Yeah, so the wind is a huge influencing factor of plant life up here. If you look down here, you can see a lot of low growing plants and you can hear the wind coming through. Like any sort of trees that can grow up here are uh, part of the Crumholds community, which is crooked wood. These, these high wind conditions require the plants to stay low in order to uh, be able to hold on to their vegetation. You can see here, these plants were stripped of their needles just because of the, the high winds. And in the winter, the ice particles can fly through and strip off the, the vegetation, like kind of like sand blowing through the wind. Another thing is it's a, it's a clear day today, but oftentimes it's cloudy up here. And that can be another challenge that the plant communities face without a lot of sunlight. It can be difficult for photosynthesis to occur. And so they have to have special adaptations to be able to store energy to keep them going throughout these harsh seasons. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of seasons, it's mid-September here. We could have snow up here any day, actually. And when you think about the length of the growing season here on Mount Mansfield, it's about 60 days of frost-free weather. And uh, that's compared to 180 days along the shoreline of Lake Champlain. So a third of the growing season up here in the elevation change. And that translates uh, to certainly harsher growing conditions. But it also translates to lots of snow, which is a lot of the reason people uh, enjoy being up here. But glad to be up here with you, Michael. And NR1, we look forward to you to getting the chance right. to be up here uh, on your own as well, hiking along the long trail on the ridge line of Mount Mansfield.